Welcome in to Between Two Meeples. I'm Armando Castaneda, and today we get to talk about six games that I got to play in the month of November and December that either you know, blew my expectations out of the water or just completely you know, crapped the bet. So if that sounds interesting to you and you want to see which games those are, stick with me. We're about to jump into it. First game on the agenda is going to be Knit of Alir. So if you watched my gateway video that I created with Barn Maid Games and Isaac Myers, on his list was Knit of Alir. And this was one of his auction games. He pumped it up. Now, I go into it very skeptical. One of my favorite auction games is Modern Art. I do like Raw. There is a few games out there when it comes to auction games that I really enjoyed. So my expectations were relatively high when it came to this game. Or, you know, before I went into this game. And, shockingly enough, Knit of Alir does, does, did both a really great job at the whole auction system. And it's a blind auction the whole entire time. So there's no, you know, there's no pressure if you don't like auction games. There's no real, like, sense that you have to go out and you have to go and bid. There's, there's always second prizes, third prizes, you're building an engine in front of you, so getting a card isn't going to be the end of the world. Now, with that being said, my wife hates auction games. She does not like modern art. She does not like Raj. She doesn't like the fact that if you miss out on something, then you're going to get screwed. You just, or if you outbid somebody, you're screwing them. Like, it's just, it's just real bad when it comes to her because it you know, feels real mean at times. Knit of a Lear, you have five coins in your hand, and everyone's going to go out and bid. Most of the time, somebody is placing a zero out there because when you place a zero out in one of the, in one of the three sections to bid, you get to make your two coins that you put down below, you get to smash them together and get a bigger coin out of it. So somebody's always going to either play a low number out there, so it's not as bad when you're trying to get it. You can strategically plan to get bigger coins to take what you want from the system or to, you know, strategically place your coins out there to get cards that, you know, people don't want if you're trying to build up your greens to get, you know, the better multipliers and stuff like that. So Knit of Alir, if you haven't played this game, a very good auction game, very great at Gateway. I do trust Isaac Meyer in his opinion now. If you haven't tried it, go check it out, Knit of Alir. So when it comes to card games, card games need to be fun. They need to have some sort of replayability. There's like, card games can't be boring. There's 500 freaking card games that come out a year, it feels like. Everyone and their mother has an idea of what to do with the card game. So the card games have to have something to pull you in other than just like a fancy theme or pictures or something like that. There's gotta be a reason to play the card game. When it came to Cat Lady, there you're you're playing the game, you have your your market of nine cards that are always out there, and it just doesn't feel like there's enough going on in the game for it to be worth it or fun for a long period of time. There's no strategy. It felt like every time you were going out there to pull cards from there, you were pulling basically out of five rows, and you took what well, best that was available for you because there really is no it's just either get food or get a cat get food get a cat or there's one other thing where you can do a set collection there's no real depth into the game so um cat lady fell super short for me it's not a game that's probably going to stay in my collection for very long it's just not strategic way too gateway way too light for a card game in my opinion so that is cat lady Dog Lover, on the other hand, they finally took the the base game of Cat Lady and gave you something to do, gave you some sort of strategy. They made the game interesting and replayable, finally, inside of Dog Lover. Uh, not only do you get to you know recruit your dogs in or your, your your pets, and then you get to add things to them. Now they have traits where you know they pair together. So now you have to go look for small dog, medium dog, and big dog traits in order to make the dog more valuable now you can start you know you can either start tucking walk cards you can start putting trick cards out there 
Um, there's just so many things that you can now work to. There's different types of cards in the game where it feels like there's value when you're going out there and drafting. You want to stop somebody from getting good cards. Whereas before, it was just like, Okay, I, I guess I'm going to take this. I mean, are you going after toys? I mean, there's two of each toy. It's it's not in a two-player game or even you know, not a two-player game. It didn't seem like there was much like defense going on. Whereas in Dog Lover, you know, you were strategically trying to stop people from doing things because it's going to be too value for them or you're trying to get them into your hand to make your animals more valuable. The other system that I really enjoyed with Dog Lover was the fact that you can do tricks now. I think it was like special dog tricks is what they're called, which allow you instead of just taking, you know, a straight line up and down or a column or a row. Now you can do like one big square or you can do like the corners. Like now the, the dog have these special abilities where you can pick up different styles of cards, which made the game, in my opinion, that much better to give you the option to pick up cards differently instead of the same, you know, row or column. So, all right. Let's start off talking. So we started talking about the light games, those first four, really relatively easy to talk about. Let's get into the heavier stuff, the Euros, the medium to heavyweight Euros that I love to play. I have high expectations when it comes to Vitella Serta games because I have played about half of them so far. So the Gallerus was the next one up on my list that I wanted to play. And it was awesome. I love the Galarus. I loved it so much. I played it three times this month. Like it is probably my favorite Vital Asserta game so far. Give me, if you like Vital Asserta games, let me know which one that I should play next. Because as of right now, I got an escape plan, Galarist, uh, Lisboa. I feel like there's one more I can't even remember. But I'm working my, my way through all the Lacerda games. And the Galarist was amazing. I loved the economic portion of the game where you are pushing the fame of the artwork of the of the artists to try to make them more valuable at the end of the game. Everyone is constantly trying to make the artwork valuable. Sometimes you're working together, sometimes you're not because it depends on what artwork you have. Um, I loved the fact that you are trying to recruit these like people. These There's either pink, brown, or white people that you're trying to get into your museum. Each one of these meeples has a different value when it comes to what you're trying to do. The brown people will help you get money. The white people are basically your wild. Your pink help you get your fame. And it's this big push and pull where you can, you know, you can try to get people in. You can pull people out from somebody's lobby back into the area, into the central area, and then try to bring them back into yours. So it's this big push and pull. I loved the fact that you only really had four places to go on the map. And if you got bumped out of one of those places that you were able to basically do another turn again, if you set yourself up correctly on the track to be able to use, I believe it was fame or I don't remember the stars, whatever the bottom track was, you were able to use those to basically get a second turn out of being bumped. And in a three player game, it felt very, I needed to like not bump somebody because I didn't want them to get that like extra benefit. But in a four player game, you're just like, everyone's getting bumped all the time. It was everyone focusing on offense, no one worried about it. And the games just felt very close, very tight at the end. Everyone was just you know doing what they needed to do. So I can't stress it enough. It was an amazing game, very heavy. But if you like that heavy, if you want to get into Lacerda games, like I felt like that one was just, it was awesome. I highly recommend it. And it is one of those games where now I can't wait to go out, find it and get it into my collection. So that is the galleries. I don't want to ramble anymore, but from the beauty in which Vitella Lacerda creates to the beast in which Splatter creates. Splatter, I, I don't, I don't know, buddies, guys, you have to sp put some effort into making the game look pretty. Please, you got the ugliest games out there, but they're really good games. Like I do really enjoy. You know, I'm glad you guys are putting some money into you know getting Food Chain Magnet up to, 
you know, somewhat today's standards in looks and feel. Um, Indonesia, God, that one has to be redid. And yeah, please make that one look pretty. The map is probably the ugliest thing that I've ever seen other than, you know, it's just, it's, it's bad. But the game I want to talk about is Horseless Carriage. You would think being in 2023, this game just came out, that they would have done something new, spent the money to make this thing look beautiful. And it was not. It looked exactly like, you know, the old food chain magnet, just the big gray square board. It was, uh, it was ugly. But the game itself was amazing. I did have, you know, going into something that when they were setting up, I'm like, oh, I'm not going to enjoy this. It's going to look, it's just, it just feels bad. It was great. The mechanics, the way that the economy worked, the way that the cars got put out there, the way that you bought everything, to the way that the first player selection happened, like everything was amazing. Like I really enjoyed Horseless Carriage as a whole. The first player selection mechanic was just, I wish more board games did it, where you could either spend points to you know, be first or you can spend points to be last. But no matter what choice you selected, you got the best of something. If you went last, you were the first one to sell. So that, it was great. Then you got the cream of the crop of what the board had. If you went first in engineering, you went last in sales, but then you got the best of being able to make the cars, like the engineering required to do all the cars. So there was always a perk no matter where you finished in the turn order, which was, why don't more games do that? My only downfall, and this is where my expectation, like this is where the game goes from, like it was great to, it just crashed for me. And that was the player board, where you were trying to build your, what is it, factory, I, I believe is, is the right terminology for it. When you have these little cardboard pieces and you're having this little, think of Baron Park, uh, if, you, if anybody you play that, just cardboard on top of cardboard. You have to fill in these little squares and you're trying to make out this factory. Well. They're pretty tiny squares. They're pretty tiny little pieces that are going on top of it. And if you bump the table, if you bump your pieces, if you bumped anything, like it was just a constant battle trying to make sure that either my stuff was fitting on my board correctly or that no one else was cheating. There was, I felt like we spent an hour just waiting for somebody to finish fixing their board because they got called out because there's no way that all that fits on your board. And by the time you put everything back together, you go, see, you have two pieces hanging off and they go, oh, no, no, no. And you're just like, oh. The only downfall of this whole entire game was that interaction on your own player board because it's just, it's too much to maintain sometimes. It's too much to handle. Other than that, like the game was great. I mean, this game would probably be amazing on like a BGA where you don't have to worry about the things bumping and stuff like that. An electronic version, whether you had an app, you had a pad that you could hold everything on, like that seems like the smartest way to go about doing this thing because the way that they have it now is just, it's gross, it's ugly, and it makes me not want to play the game again just because of I know that we're going to go through it again. Somebody's going to bump their board. Somebody's going to think that it's going to fit because, you know, they, they pushed it here, but they don't realize it's falling out on this side. It's just, uh, so, horse's carriage. Uh, you did, you know, you didn't blow my expectation out of the water, but it was a great game that has a bunch of flaws when it comes to the development side. Just, you know, the replayability of it's all there, but I just, I don't know if I want to play an ugly game that just, I know that I'm going to fight with people's boards with. So that's where I'm at. I don't want to ramble. <sighs> all right. So those are the six games that I played this month. Um, I hope you enjoyed my reviews of them. Uh, come 2024, I'm looking at doing individual game reviews. Finally, I'm about ready to change my studio, my setup. I'll be ready for 2024 to kick off a new look, kick off a lot of new things, and we're going to get into individual board game review. I am also I am also looking at trying to do a giveaway in January, so if you're still here, uh, give me a subscribe. It'll go out to any of my subscribers that I do have. We'll let you know how to get in on the giveaway for next year. So, I am Armando Castaneda. This is Between Two Meeples. I'm out.